In this session, we're going to look at word studies. Now, I need to tell you up front, this will probably be your favorite session. In other words, you're going to get more out of this session than possibly any other discussion we have in Greek for the rest of us. Because this is the chapter that you can really use every single day, every single week, every single Bible study, every single sermon, okay? So we're going to be looking specifically at how you study what the Greek word means behind the English in your translation. So it's a fun session and look forward to covering the material with you. The most important phrase I have to teach you is the phrase semantic range. What that means is that no word has just one meaning. A word has a semantic range. Semantic just has to do with meaning. And range means a word has a range of meanings. I sometimes talk about a word having a bundle of meanings. Think of someone carrying a bundle of sticks and there's lots of different sticks in the bundle. Well, the bundle represents the word. And while the word may have one or perhaps two basic meanings, it can have lots of secondary meanings. There can be a lot of ideas attached to a word, all the different sticks in the bundle. Well, that's what a semantic range is. Think, for example, of the English word run. What does run mean? Well, it actually means a lot of things, doesn't it? I mean, you can run a race. But you can also run to the store in your car. You can run a business from your desk. You can run up your credit card. <laughs> your students can run you ragged. I mean, there's many, many different meanings, different sticks in the bundle that represents the word run. That's the semantic range. And every word has a semantic range. And the problem is that the semantic range for a word in Greek is, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, never the exact same as the semantic range for the corresponding English word. In other words, we see a Greek word and we say it's love, it's, it's, well, it's agapao. And you say, okay, well, what does that mean in English? How do I convey this idea? Well, we have this English word love, but agapao has meanings that love doesn't have. And love has meanings that agapao doesn't have. See, they're different semantic ranges. And that's part of what makes translation so difficult. Uh, one of the things I've really enjoyed being on these committees is that you have people from different areas of the world and we all hear words differently. In other words, my semantic range it's not going to be the same as your semantic range. I'm going to hear certain things connected with this word, and you'll hear some of them, but you'll also hear different things, things that I wouldn't hear. So the semantic range is a, a critical issue, and it's one of the things that makes uh, translation so difficult and, in a sense, so rewarding. Let me give you a, what is a kind of a modern example. You're going along, and in the Greek, it says that you're a doulos of Christ. How are you going to translate doulos? Well, there are several English words that overlap in meaning. So, for example, there is servant. A doulos is a servant, so I'm a servant of Christ. There's also the word slave. Well, I am a slave of Christ, and in certain contexts, slave works, but in other contexts, it really doesn't work. Servant works. And then there's the old English bond servant. And frankly, bond servant is a really good word. I just wish it weren't so old. Because I think it actually is closer to what doulos means than servant or slave. It's been interesting in these translation meetings to talk about this because the problem is if you're an American, you hear things with the word slave that are not appropriate for the ancient world and its slavery. Yes, slavery is horrible. And in both cultures, there's slavery due to war, slavery based on race. But there's a lot of other things connected with it. And then actually, bond servant is better in most cases, but it's an old English word. And some translation committees aren't comfortable with it. But you see the problem. Doulos has a meaning. It has a semantic range. And the English word servant covers part of that semantic range. Slave covers part. 
uh, bond servant covers part, but we don't have a word that actually is the same thing as doulos. So how do you translate it? Well, that's a translational issue. For Greek, for the rest of us, the issue is how are we going to do our word study not based on servant or slave or bond servant or whatever our translation uses, but how do we get through the English back to the Greek so that properly our word study is on doulos, how to do a Greek word study, in other words. Well, there's four basic steps to this process. Let me just give them to you in summary, and then we're going to go through each one in a little more detail. Now, the first thing you have to do in doing a word study is decide, well, what word do you want to study? I mean, there are a lot of words you're reading along, and a study in Greek isn't going to help you come to a better understanding of the word. In other words, it's a basic word that we understand what it means. Uh, but you want to you want to be able to look for the clues to say you know this word in English probably needs to be studied. Uh, maybe I'm not sure what it means, or maybe it has ramifications in Greek or in theology that uh, I don't see in English. So the first step is simply to pick the right word, and the next step is to get to the Greek word behind it. And this is what we're going to use Strong's for, and what we're going to use the computer programs for the reverse interlinears. And then the third step, and this is a crucial one, what is the range of meaning? What's the semantic range for the Greek word? In other words, you can't see what the Greek word is behind it. Oh, it's doulos. Oh, well, therefore it's slave. Or, or therefore it's servant. Or, or therefore it's bond servant. You have to look at the Greek word and you have to see what its range of meanings is. And then fourthly, you go to context. Context is king. Uh, context makes so many decisions. And all the Greek can do is give you the legitimate range of meanings. Uh, but Greek can't necessarily say it's this one. Uh, these four possible or three possible meanings, uh, doulos means this. That's not a function of Greek. That's a function of context. So you find out it's doulos, you look at the range of meanings of doulos, and then you look at the particular verse and say, okay, which one fits? And it'd be nice in some cases to always be able to uh, use the same English word for the same Greek word, but you can't always do that. You have to look at context. You know, another good example is the Greek word polis. If uh, the Bible says that Jesus goes to the polis of Nazareth, all right, he's, he's going up home, and there's, I think it occurs like 162 times or about that in the Gospels. And there are some translations that always translate Paulus as city. You know what the problem with that is? Well, archaeologically, we know that there's about 600 people living in Nazareth when Jesus was there. Now, if you have a Paulus that has 600 people, what do you call it? Well, you don't call it a city, do you? In other words, Paulus has a very wide range of meanings that in English would incorporate city, like the city of Jerusalem, or maybe a village, or hamlet, or <laughs> white spot in a road. I don't know. Uh, Nazareth is more a white spot in the road than anything else with 600 people. But the point is, Paulus has this very wide range of meaning, and we don't have a word with the same range of meaning. City is much bigger in our uh, registers in how we hear the word than what Paulus actually is in a verse where the context says, this is the Paulus of Nazareth. Okay, see the problem? Okay, so those are the four steps. You find the word that you want to study, you find the Greek word behind it, you find that Greek word's range of meaning, and then you look at the context to decide which of those ranges of meanings fit in this particular context, okay? All right, so how do you choose the right word? Well, there's no real cut and dry way to do this. Uh, what you wanna do is you read the text and you go, which words stand out to me? Which words are significant? Which words, if I removed them, uh, the whole narrative would fall apart? Uh, perhaps what theological terms are in the passage that I would need to look up. Which words are repeated? And maybe not just the same word, but a word and its synonyms. Um, perhaps words that just don't make sense. You look at like for Jesus is our propitiation. Well, I don't know many people whose active vocabulary includes the word propitiation. And you look at it and you go, oh, that might be a good word worth looking up. 
Or perhaps you're into comparing translations as I like to do. And you notice in this one word, this translation uses English word A, but another translation uses a different word. Translation C uses another one. Uh, in other words, it's obvious that the translations have a difference of opinion as to how to express the Greek word behind it. I mean, those are the kinds of things that we look at to try to decide what words are important. Sometimes I think of a bicycle wheel and there's a hub and there's spokes. And it's the hub that's important. It's those words and ideas that create the center of the bicycle wheel. Because if you pull the hub out, the wheel falls apart, right? Now you can pull a spoke out here and a spoke out there and it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect the meaning. But uh, I wouldn't be doing word studies on the spokes, on the words that represent the spokes. I want to find the words that represent the hub, the center, the, the big idea, the main point that the narrative is making. And those are the words that I want to study. So anyway, you've got to go through and you've got to find the right uh, word to study. Okay, so that's step one. Step two then is how do you find the Greek word? Well, I'm glad you asked. I have several things that can help you do that. Um, this is my uh, reverse interlinear. It's the first one that I did. It's my favorite. Uh, this is the one that keeps English word order. It's the NIV 1984 version. And so, for example, you can read on here in John 3, 16, and it says, for God so loved the world. Well, I mean, it's a common example, but let's use love, okay? Which Greek word, there's a lot of Greek words for love, which one is John using, is Jesus using in John 3, 16? Well, what you do is you find, for God so loved the world, and you go under loved, and it says agape sin. So that's the inflected Greek form. Underneath it, it tells you it's a verb. It's aorist active indicative, third singular. So that's its parsing. And then you go underneath it, and it's number 26. Okay, that's a GK number 26 that you can then use in a dictionary to go see this word. It's agapao, but it's word 26 in the GK numbering system. So... That's a really easy way to find the Greek word behind the English, uh, and especially if you like the 84 NIV, uh, this is a good text to use. So that's one way to get to the Greek one. The other interlinear uh, is the uh, Greek and English interlinear, and we did several versions of it. This is the NASB NIV, which is of, of all the different versions I did, this, this is my favorite, because what it does, it has the interlinear down the middle, and then it has the NIV on one side and the NASB on the other. So you can see what uh, our translation is and the information. And then you can see how the NIV and the NASB translators did it as well. But again, this is a uh, Greek-English interlinear, so it keeps Greek word order. So you go to John 3.16 and you say, uh, Hutos gar agapesen, and you look under agapesen and it says loved. So you know you've got the right word. It says it's 26, so it's the GK number, and then it gives the parsing again. So if you'd rather follow Greek word order, then this is a, this is a resource to use. So that's another way to find it. There are, of course, other ways called computers. <laughs> and this is how many people get to the Greek. So if you look at this screenshot, you can see how my computer's set up. I'm using Accordance, uh, which is my favorite uh, software program for this. And I've got it set up to show the English on the left and then the interlinear on the right. And it's an interlinear that you can create and customize any way you want. And then at the bottom, it has the details information where you can get more information. So what I did in this case is I'm looking at Matthew 7, 13. It's entered through the narrow gate. So well, I wonder what narrow means. Why is it narrow? Is there a clue in the Greek as to what is so different about the narrow gate as opposed to the wide gate? So when I do a mouse over, it also then highlights the word in the interlinear on the right-hand side. And so I see that the Greek word is stenes. Its GK number is 4728. And then I've got, again, this is all configurable in accordance. Uh, and the Logos will let you do the same kind of thing as well. But the lexical form I have showing next is stenos. And then I show how this word is translated in my translation and in the ESV and the NIV uh, 2011. You can see the nomenclature off to the left. 
and all of us translated it narrow. And then down in the details pane, I get more information, don't I? The gloss is narrow. It's GK number 5101. Lexical form is stenos, and it's transliterated S-T-E-N-O-S. And then I've got the parsing information below it. And I actually have my concordance set up so that when I hit uh, a command key, it pulls up a secondary dictionary down below, which happens to be BDAG, and I can get more information on it. So now that we know the Greek word behind the English, it's time to move on to step three, and that is to establish the semantic range of that particular Greek word. Now, when you look down at the details pane or in, in some of the other resources, all that we can show you is the gloss, right? Just the very most basic kind of center of the semantic range, that's what it's doing. So that's not good enough, okay? We, we've got to be able to expand out and see its semantic range. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. One of my favorites is to look at different translations. So when I'm working on my computer, uh, I will often have five or six translations open. And so when I'm looking at one verse, I can pop over very easily to see how the other translations handle a word. And I go, oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't know the word could mean that. And that, that kind of stuff. And, and that's one way to find the semantic range. Another is to use the Englishman's concordance. I don't have an example of it, but I did want to show you an online resource that's free that will kind of do the same thing. And if you go to my personal website, BillMounts.com, there is a Greek dictionary online there for you. And as you go through, you can see I, I've given you the dictionary form. Uh, this is a different word. This is de los. Uh, transliterations, the Strong's and GK's number, and then some statistics, how often it occurs, and, and different bits and pieces of information. But at the bottom, I have a Greek-English concordance. And what I've done is that I've listed every place in the New Testament that that particular Greek word occurs. And if you can focus in real closely, you can see that I've also parsed every inflected word for you. So this is a, a really good way, I think, to be able to go through a, a Greek word and see all the different ways that it's translated in the New Testament. And it's my translation. It's, it's not the NIV or ESV. But it will show you, again, the semantic range of the word. So that's one way to do it. And again, it's free. Another way is to get a good computer program. And they can be set up to show semantic ranges very well. Here's an example, again, using accordance. And this is a, a really good example. Actually, a pastor friend of mine called me uh, the other day and asked me about this verse while I was looking at it. And there's two different ways to translate a verb. It's in 2 Corinthians 3.18. And Paul says, and I'm reading here in the NIV, it says that we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It's a, it's a fantastic verse. And it's really important, though, because it says we contemplate the Lord's glory, and as we contemplate, that's part of the transformation process. Well, that's, that's kind of an important thing, isn't it? But if you look in the NIV, there's a footnote that says, or reflect. Now, if you look at how I've got accordance set up, you know, the translation I'm using uh, is doing more that idea of reflecting. And we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror. So the idea is the mirror is reflecting back. So I did a, a mouse over on that. And then in my interlinear, it comes up. And here I've got the NIV. It says, contemplate. You can look at some of the other translations, though. And you can see underneath it the two different options of beholding or contemplating. Well, that's the semantic range of the word, at least in this particular context. So in other words, you can use these computer programs to show you how the different translations are handling words. That shows you semantic range. But I also have my computer set up right now to show a dictionary. And so on the right-hand side, you can see this dictionary and it has its range of meaning there in the different options. It means to show in a mirror, to present a, a clear and correct image of a thing, um, to reflect, 2 Corinthians 3.18. In other words, you're getting both the ideas of 
beholding in the sense of reflecting and then contemplating illustrated in the dictionary. But as they say on television, wait, there's more. <laughs> there are actual books out there, word study books out there that are designed to help you do these word studies and among other things to show you the semantic range. And sorry, but one of them happens to be the one I was a general editor of, uh, the Complete Expository Dictionary. And let me real, just real quickly explain how to use this. There's a page in the front that ex tells you how to use it. So if you do pick up the book, please read the instructions. But it's, uh, there's a band of gray in the, uh, on the edge here. The gray is a Hebrew dictionary, and then to its right is a small Greek dictionary, and then the larger white area is the major dictionary. So I used the illustration in an earlier session about parakletos, the, the paraclete. Let's just use that here. What you can do, if, if you know that that's the Greek word, you can go into the back section and just about every Greek word there is in the Bible is uh, handled back here. And you can look and see parakletos and you can get its definition. Specifically, you can get its range of meanings. And then at the bottom it says, see counselor. That's the system I use to say, this Greek word is also being discussed in the main part of the dictionary. And so you can go to that main part of the dictionary and you can look up counselor and you can get a couple of columns of information on what parakletos means. Now the difference is the Hebrew and the Greek are in Greek and Hebrew word order. In the main part is an English word order. So if you didn't know the Greek word, you could still work, look up love and you would have the different Greek and Hebrew words for love and what they mean. Or you could look up counselor and if there's alternate Greek and Hebrew words for that, along with parakletos, you could look them up as well. By the way, that's basically how the system works. If you only know the English, you have to use the front section. But if you know the Greek word, you can look in the back, get your gloss, get your basic semantic range, and then it'll be cross-referenced if I discuss it in the main section, okay? All right, so, but that's how you would use that. And again, that's how you would get the semantic range for the book. Now, there's one other book I want to mention, and these are just, this book is priceless. Um, this is called the, Dictionary, the New International Dictionary of New Testament Theology. It's edited by a really good friend of mine, Verlin Verbrugge, who was my editor for 25 years at Zonovan who uh, unfortunately passed away recently. But he took this four or five volume series and condensed it into this book. I've been told this is the great secret of Zondervan and this is a fabulous book. But if you go to uh, like Parakletos here, you're gonna get several long columns of information on it. So this is English, uh, Greek only, but there's more information in here than there is in mine, okay? So there's a, a wide range of possible sources that you can use to figure out the Greek words. In all fairness, I should mention one other book is published by Erdman's. It's uh, Dr. Bromley's Abridgment of Kittle, and it's, a, again, a one volume, roughly equivalent to what Verlin did, and it's a very, very good source as well. So another good place to uh, see semantic ranges and to see what words mean, okay? So multiple ways to find the range of meanings of a Greek word. All right, so now we come to step four, <laughs> context. How are you gonna use context to look at the different options in the semantic range to figure out which one fits in that verse. And this is the illustration I like to use is of a series of concentric circles. And what you have is you have the word in the middle. And so you're trying to figure out what that word means. You, you go out to the verse and you say, is there anything in the verse that helps me understand what the word means? If there's not, go out to the paragraph. If not there, go out to the book. If not there, go out to other books by the same author. And the whole idea is you want to stop as quickly as possible. You, you, want to not, you want to be as close to that actual word in that actual verse as possible because people use the same word differently in different contexts. So just because Paul uses sarks here to refer to one thing, in another passage, he's going to use sarks to refer to something else. Here it might be flesh. Here it might be our sinful human nature. 
And so the further you get away from the actual verse you're looking at that's got sarks in it, the less confident you can be that this is helping you understand the verse in the verse you're looking at, all right? Now, there is this area outside the circle, which is uh, the literature outside the New Testament. Sometimes you have to go out there. Sometimes there, the word occurs like only once or maybe only twice in the New Testament. And you're scratching your head and go, I don't know. I'm still not sure what this word means. So maybe you need to go see what it means in Philo or what it means in Josephus. But boy, be careful. Because once you get out of the New Testament, and especially outside of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, you, you have very little confidence that these people are using the word in the same way that the author is using this word in this verse that you're studying. Okay, so the whole idea of the concentric circles is that you want to stop as quickly as you possibly can. Okay? All right. Now, I'm kind of a words guy. I like words. And so, among other things, I like signs. And street signs are funny to me. And uh, I've been just give you a couple of examples of why context is so important. Or to say it another way, we all do this contextually. We hear words and we all understand them in context. The difficulty is that for the Bible, it's a New Testament context, it's 2,000 years ago. But we use context to define words all the time, and street signs are a great illustration. So for example, what does this sign mean? Well, it, it doesn't mean stop, right? O otherwise, you'd be sitting there, and I never would have gotten to the studio today. No, the sign actually means stop and then go. Well, why don't you say stop and go? Well, because we understand it contextually. We're at a street corner. We understand that we're supposed to stop, and only after we come to a complete stop behind the red sign, then we can go, right? See, that's context. That's not what the sign says. It's what, it's what context tells us the sign means, all right? Now, here's my favorite sign from when I was at Gordon Conwell, when I lived in Boston. I'd never seen this sign before. The sign says, go children slow. Now, what does that mean? You can go ahead if you want because the children are slow. <laughs> well, that's in word order. That's what it means, right? The words are all the same size. Go. The children are slow. Go, children, but go slowly. It's incorrect grammar, but that doesn't stop street signs. Many of them are incorrect grammar. They forget what adverbs are, but that's another thing. No, the sign means go slowly because there are children present. You go, wait a minute, that's the least obvious meaning of the sign. Well, actually, I didn't know what the sign meant when I first saw it. And I know that we forget adverbs and adjectives, so slow, slowly, okay, that makes sense. But it wasn't until I inverted the order, and then I looked contextually and went, oh, I'm in a neighborhood. There's a lot of uh, garages opening up um, onto the street. Oh, there must be kids here. See, I use context to interpret a really bizarre kind of sign. But no sign is more crazy than this sign. Thickly settled. I remember seeing that and go, thickly settled? What does that mean? And my default kind of sarcastic position was, hey, the people here aren't very smart. They're pretty thick in the head. Um, no, it actually is a technical sign in New England for uh, how thickly uh, the, the homes are put together. And if you have homes a certain distance apart, there's an automatic speed limit. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. I was raised in California and Kentucky and other places. I, I didn't know what the sign meant. Uh, thankfully, I never got a ticket. But you look at it and you go, there's no way that these words can mean anything until you know the context of them. Okay, so that was just my kind of way of trying to illustrate this point, that we use context all the time. To interpret words. Okay? All right. Well, let me just give you uh, one example of each of those concentric rings to show you how this works. In Romans 12, 1, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What is a living sacrifice? I mean, when you sacrifice something, you kill it. So what's that's odd. What's a living sacrifice? Well, if you keep reading in the same verse, you'll see that means it's holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual 
worship. Now, you might have guessed that instinctively, but a living sacrifice is a spiritual act of worship. Okay, so you're using the verse to interpret the word. Now, it's interesting, if you go down to the King James, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Go, wait a minute. Spiritual? Reasonable? Well, those are two really different things. Well, guess what? The Greek word means both. That's its semantic range. And what's going on in the King James is the interpretive position is Paul saying, in light of all that God has done for you, this is the only thing that makes sense. It's a reasonable thing to do. Well, that we have no English word that means spiritual and reasonable, so you got to choose. And some translations may footnote the other. By the way, the point is that we're using a sentence to interpret a word in the sentence. Okay, let's expand out a bit and go to the paragraph. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, famous paragraph. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Man of God? What? What's a man of God? What about a woman of God? What about a boy of God? What about a girl of God? What, what on earth is man of God? Well, if you read this in context, you'll understand that the man of God is Timothy. Now, from the larger context, we know this phrase from the Old Testament refers to a special person, a person who has a special relationship with God. So the prophets are men of God, for example. It's not that Timothy is male, that's not the point, but Paul is using an Old Testament language to encourage Timothy to preach the word, and he's encouraging Timothy to preach the word by pointing out that it comes from the very mouth of God, a doctrine of inspiration. And he's saying to Timothy, using Old Testament language, that scripture is profitable so that you, Timothy, a man of God, a person of God, I mean, you see what's going on? We're using the paragraph to say this isn't only for Tyler or Hayden, my sons, it's also for Kirsten, my daughter. It's not a male-oriented term and hence part of the problem of interpretation. But the point is that we use the paragraph to interpret the word, okay? Let me give you another example of how the paragraph, or in this case, actually the chapter, will help you interpret a word. In 1 Timothy 3.11, the ESV says that this is in the list of qualifications for elders and then uh, for deacons. And in the discussion of deacons, uh, Paul says, their wives must likewise be dignified, not slanders, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Wives, okay, so this is the qualification uh, for the spouse of the deacon. And then he goes on to talk about their children. Now, what's interesting is the NASB, among other translations, doesn't translate it wives, it translates it woman. So women must likewise be dignified. Well, what is it? Is it wives which would be the wives of deacons, or is it a woman, which would be a female deacon, a deaconess, uh, or, uh, by the way, the word deaconess in Greek wasn't created till like the end of the second, end of the third century, so uh, a deacon in Greek technically is either a man or a woman. But anyway, in this passage, the Greek is gune, and gune is either translated wife or woman, uh, wife or a, a female. Well, and if it's just, if it's female, if it's woman, then it's referring to female deacons, okay? It's a very hard discussion. I mean, the arguments are, it gets on six, one and a half, a dozen of the other. It's a very difficult discussion. And there's actually pretty good arguments for both. But the point is, you're not going to be able to make up your mind on how to translate gune if you look just at the verse. You're going to have to look at the whole flow. And the argument is, for woman, meaning a deaconess, is the word likewise. Because likewise ties it in with the previous argument that elders are a certain way, likewise deacons are a certain way, likewise deaconesses are a certain kind of person. But the point is you're using a, a whole chapter really to define a word. Okay, let's go out even further and let's look at the context of the book. You're in 1 Timothy 4.16. Very personal passage where Paul is telling Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, meaning biblical doctrine, persist in this, for by so doing you will save 
both yourself and your hearers. <laughs> you will save, really. Is Paul teaching works salvation? There are actually people, commentary writers, who claim that in the pastorals, the author is saying you can earn your salvation, so obviously Paul didn't write the pastorals. Well, all you have to do is look at the pastorals as a whole, either just 1 Timothy or 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus together, and you'll see their doctrine of salvation is very standard. It's very Pauline. Paul did write the pastorals. And so when you look at this, you will save, what does that mean? Well, you have to interpret it in light, and in light of the whole book, and it means you'll work out your salvation, as Paul says in Philippians 2. This, this is the sanctification process of, of growing up in Christ, and this is how you work out your salvation. And the reason you know that uh, verse 16 isn't heretical is that you're interpreting it in light of the context of the book as a whole. All right? Now, let me give you one final example, and this is probably the most famous example. And this is an example of sometimes you have to look at the New Testament as a whole. And this gets down to the supposed conflict between Paul and James. And what's interesting is that they're both, at least on the surface, they sound like they're arguing exact opposites. Paul is arguing that you're justified by your faith, not by works. And James is arguing you're justified by your works, not just by your faith. Okay, this is, this is the prime example that is used in, in this area. And the problem is they both quote exactly the same passage. And they both quote out of Genesis. So in Romans 4, 2 to 3, Paul says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Quote, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? And here's the citation from Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Okay, so he's using Abraham, this quote out of Genesis 15, 6, to prove that justification is by faith. Look what James does in chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works and the scripture was fulfilled that says, same citation, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he, Abraham, was called a friend of God. Now, how are you gonna understand those two verses? Well, you're probably not going to be forced to deal with this issue unless you look at them in the context of the New Testament whole. And what's going on is that Paul and James are using the word justification with two different meanings. That's the semantic range of the word. Paul is talking about justification in the sense of how do you move into a just relationship with God. And James is talking about how do you live within a just relationship with God. Justify it's the same word in both places, but the context is significantly different. So context is your friend, and that's where you go to decide what words mean. Now, we're almost done, but let me just cover a couple of basic mistakes that people make. And I want to be negative, but there are a couple of basic mistakes that people make in word studies. Uh, one of them, and I'm thinking of mistakes here that are that you, now that you're starting to know a little Greek, may be prone to make. Okay, so I want to be careful here. Uh, one mistake is an anachronism, and that is using English to define Greek. Okay, let's, let's be clear. English wasn't a language till 11, 1200 AD, okay? You cannot define a Greek word based on an English word, okay? That's going the wrong direction, right? So for example, in Romans 1.16, I don't know how many sermons I've heard, uh, the gospel is the power, uh, and the Greek word is dunamis. It's the power of God for salvation. Well, dunamis, that's dynamite, and God's salvation is dynamite. No, pastor's imagination is dynamite. <laughs> um, you can't take dynamite, which comes from the Greek, I'm assuming, dunamis, but you can't take dynamite and read all of our semantic range, bang, loud, powerful stuff, into dunamis. Uh, that's, you just can't do it. It's anachronistic. You're going the wrong direction. Uh, 
Another example is in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver. The Greek word is hilaron, from which we get the English word hilarious. So God loves hilarious givers. So laugh and cheer and be happy as you give. Well, maybe you should be happy. Maybe you should be cheerful as you give. That doesn't mean you have to be hilarious about it. All right, hilarious has its semantic range, but you can't even take it and push it back into Greek because you're being anachronistic. See what happens? So be very, very careful of interpreting Greek in light of English meanings. The other problem that I wanted to point out is another common problem. It's called the etymological fallacy. Etymology is how we put words together. Uh, You take morphemes, which are the smallest units of meaning, and to create words, you you put these morphemes together. And let me illustrate initially with English. Uh, What is a butterfly? Well, it's not a dairy product with wings, all right? Or what's a pineapple? It's not an apple that grows on pine trees. So when you, when you look at the etymology, and actually the etymology of butterfly is much more complex than that. It's, it's a fun thing to look into. But anyway, um, you, you can't look at the pieces and assume that the word still has the meaning of the pieces. And this is a major problem that happens in word studies. Uh, they learn a little bit of Greek, and they go to certain other dictionaries, not mine, but other dictionaries that give etymologies, and they think that the parts of the word that were used to form the word initially, are the meaning is still there. Now, sometimes uh, it is. Uh, Sometimes, for example, when Paul makes up a word, he's going to stick morphemes together and the word that he's making still carries the meaning of the uh, the morphemes. So sometimes etymology can help, but there has to be something in the context or something in the word that tells you that the meaning of the parts are still there because words change their meaning. They evolve, they grow. That's just the nature of language. That's why translations have to be updated. Language changes. And so you can't look at the morphemes, the part that makes up the word, and say, well, that's what the word means in every context. Now, the worst example of this is metanoia-o. Metanoia-o is the word that is generally translated to repent. And metanoia-o is made up of two parts, and it's it's, it's hard to get to this point, but I'm going to be a little, a little simpler in my explanation. It means to change your mind. Okay, the noyeo is, uh, has to do with the mind. And so what people have done is they've looked at the etymology of metanoieo and say, oh, repentance is changing your mind. It's not changing your behavior. Well, that's what the word means. Don't you believe the Bible, Bill? Yeah, I do believe the Bible. And repentance is never just changing your mind. Metanoia is changing your mind and your behaviors follow. And that's just, all I do is read the Bible and you can see that that's the case. But this is the worst example of the etymological fallacy there is today. That metanoieo, to change the mind, always means to change the mind and not your behavior. I wonder how John the Baptist would have felt if the Pharisees say, hey, I'm going to change my mind, but I'm going to keep living in greed. That's okay, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's not what repentance is, but that's what the etymolo- etymological fallacy is and why you have to be so careful. So let me, let me really emphasize that do Greek word studies, okay? Don't be content with English. Do the four steps. It's a little more work, but when you do your word study, you know that you're actually really looking at the words that God inspired to convey the revelation of himself. Do Greek word studies.